If you want to open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 7, over these last few studies, I've just sort of done an overview, so I, just so that we get in our heads where we are and how we're doing it. You know, the, the outline for the whole book is in Revelation 1.19, uh, where Jesus tells John, write down the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which must come after. And of course the word, the, the things that must come after, or after these things, is, the, is a Greek word, metatauta. Uh, and that's used right at the start of chapter 4 again, uh, when John is bidden to come up to heaven by the Lord, and to see the things that come after these things. And that again is the word metatauta. And of course we see in chapter 1 the things which are, or the things which, sorry, the things which have been, the things which thou hast seen. And John has seen the resurrected and risen and glorified Jesus Christ. So that's the things that he's writing about to the seven churches of the Revelation. And the things which are, are the seven epochs of the church in chapters 2 and 3, the seven church ages if you want to call it that, or the seven stages of the church age. And at the end of chapter 3, the beginning of chapter 4, we looked at it from the point of view that at this point in time the church is raptured. The church is taken out of the equation. There's no more church. There's no mention of the church in chapter 6 to 19. Uh, and yet there's probably about 20 references to it in the first three chapters. So then church four, the chapters 4 and 5 shows the church in heaven. We looked at that with the, the 24 elders, etc. We, we looked. If you, if you don't know what's happening, then you need to catch up with the studies. They're either online or they'll be in the CD boxes at the back there. And then, of course, while the church is resting in the Lord in heaven in chapters 4 and 5, there's a great tribulation to come upon the earth in chapters 6 through 19, uh, a seven year period of devastation and desolation upon the earth when when the earth will be brought into subjugation again by the Lord and then of course in chapter 20 we see the start of the millennial reign which lasts for a thousand years funnily enough um, and then in chapter 21 and 22 there's the establishment of a new heaven and a new earth and uh, we all live happily ever after but we start if we look at chapter 5 just very briefly we've seen how the scroll the scroll that was presented by God the Father to the Lamb who was slain and, and, and a lot of these terms are very much Old Testament terms that we're starting to see coming in now the, the, the line of Judah the, the Lamb who was slain the Lamb of God these would all be uh, titles for the Messiah that the Jews would readily recognize that even the Gentile church, of which a lot of them were Jews, um, who were being written to by John, they would recognize this through their, through their Bible teaching, because they didn't have a New Testament. They had, only had an Old Testament, and that will become patently obvious as we get into the study this evening. But this scroll, this scroll that was, that was taken by Jesus Christ uh, there the were seven seals that were on the scroll and as each of the seals were broken a, a great devastation or cataclysmic event occurred in the earth now these were not in some measure necessarily the judgments of God these were the these, these were the sort of the, the repercussions in, in men's own rebellion uh, against God uh, it was that they were actually man made if you want to call it and, and, and satanically inspired so therefore you get a situation where you know, the, the seals, as they're broken, and they, they, they release these cataclysmic events. The scroll itself, the description of it, written on both sides with seven seals on it, indicates to us that it's some sort of title deed. And of course it's the title deed for the earth. And it's that birthright that mankind sold in the Garden of Eden when they sinned against the Lord. They sold their birthright to the earth. And that is exactly what God is in the business of taking back 
He takes his church out of the way and then he brings a judgment upon the earth so that he will get the earth back. A judgment upon the peoples of the earth to restore the earth under God's control and not under Satan's control. And if you're doubtful about Satan's control of the earth then you only need to go to the passage where Jesus was tempted by the devil. He was led by the Holy Spirit into the desert and tempted by Satan. Now one of the things that Satan said to him was he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. Supernaturally showed them all. And he said if you will just bow down to me I will grant you all of these kingdoms. Now if they weren't under Satan's control at the time all Jesus had to say well you can't because they're not yours. But they are his. God is sovereign over all things. But right now Satan is governor on this earth. He is the prince of of the air. He is the prince of this world. The prince of darkness if you want to call it that. So these cataclysmic events that are released in chapter 6 as the seals are broken because it's really a, a, the, the, the scroll itself is a, is a it's a title deed to the earth but because there's, there's something written on the outside and something written on the inside it indicates to us and it would indicate to the early church uh, particularly in the Roman culture that it was a deed of bankruptcy that it had to be bought back and the price that had to be paid was written on the outside scrolls were rarely written on both sides but a deed of bankruptcy was written on both sides so what was in it was what was up for grabs the whole earth and what was outside of it was the price that had to be paid and that was why that was why no man could be found who could open the scroll because there was no man who could pay the price. The price was an innocent death, an innocent blood. And of course the only innocent that we know of is God. So in the person of Jesus Christ, he died. So on the outside, who knows what was written exactly. But one day I'm sure we'll find out. So then we have these, the, 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 the first four seals of what we call the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The white one that comes first as the, the real political peaceful leader the rise of the antichrist if you want to call it that and he brings a false peace and then of course as the second seal is open we have a red horse a rider on a red horse who brings war because the political situations and the political machinations of men will invariably produce war and, and that's exactly what we're seeing in the world today and have seen since time immemorial and then of course following war we get the black horse which brings us famine and devastation and inflation and, and all the other things that come in, in the footsteps of war. And of course the, the interesting thing to note about that is that you know, when it talks about the, you know, the price of barley and the price of wheat and the price of wine that the, that the luxury goods, the people who can afford to buy the luxury goods in this world will not be affected by that not be affected by the famines of the world and I'm talking here about famines we see famines today but in this time when we get into the tribulation will be famines that are beyond man's imagination and then of course the pale horse comes along and he brings pestilence and death and of course pale is a very euphemistic word for the horse because it's a it actually the, the Greek word there actually describes a sickly green colour like something you would see in the pavement on a Saturday night that kind of colour um, fifth seal starts to bring in God's judgement because we see that, that there are people being martyred through the through the tribulation and then when the sixth seal opens there's great earthquakes and signs in the heavens and the sun and the moon the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon turned to blood etc and whether that is some sort of cataclysmic earthquake that occurs by God's design on the earth or whether it's the aftermath of some sort of nuclear exchange between men because as I said these, these cataclysmic events are probably more to do with man's rebellion against God and, and hatred for each other than they are to do with actually God bringing a specific judgment upon the earth at this point in time we talk about in chapter 6 verse 6 that, that speaks of the wrath of the Lamb you know who can, who can stand in the day of the wrath of the Lamb and of course in 1 Thessalonians 5 9 a proof text for that for us is that 
the church per se were, are not appointed unto wrath but unto salvation and the wrath is the same word the wrath of the lamb so we get to the end of chapter 6 and it says in verse 17 well you know the kings and the, the princes of the earth well everybody will run for the hills and, and they'll demand that the, the mountains and the rocks fall upon them because such is the devastation that has come upon the earth and who can stand it says there fallen us and hide us from the face of him who sits in the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of the wrath has come and who can stand and we looked at that there's a number of groups that stand the four angels in chapter 7 who stand at the corners of the earth and hold back the winds of the earth now the winds they could be holding physically back the winds of the earth there could be a complete and absolute nuclear winter on the earth it's entirely how you look at it there's certainly a spiritual wind and wind always talks about some sort of judgment in the Bible so they're holding back a judgment and they're holding it back because there are 144,000 people upon the earth Jews who have to be anointed and sealed with the seal of the Lord uh, to go out as evangelists 144,000 Billy Grahams uh, running around the earth now we, you have to look at the study but really it may well be 12,000 from each tribe. Many people try and say that this is not Israel, but the Lord says it himself. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed from all the tribes of Israel, and he says that a couple of times. So uh, we take it from God's word that, that it is the people of Israel that we're talking about here, the Jews. Now, I speculated the last time that the 144,000 may be raised up as evangelists to evangelize the Jews and to evangelize the Gentiles because there may be a situation here where many of them don't actually realize that they are of Jewish descent. But God knows they are. I mean, the, as I said before, you may know the nationality of your grandfather, but do you know the nationality of your great-grandfather? There's, there's very few of us could probably, we could speculate on it but to actually say that so there were many many people in Germany during World War II who were pulled out as Jews because they had relatives and their ancestry that were Jews and they, they realized not themselves that they were actually from Jewish stock so there may well be 144,000 all over the world being pulled out of all these different tribes 12,000 from each tribe and they were to be marked and sealed by God for protection and we find later of course that they stand with the Lord he doesn't lose one of them there's still 144,000 are there but we'll get to that in good time so God is not finished with the Jews Romans 9, 10, 11 you can look through that and certainly Paul makes a specific point in Romans 11 that he refers to himself as both an Israelite and a Jew so he makes no difference between them and there will be many argue today that the diff there is a difference between being a Jew and, and being part of Israel uh, for their own ends they try and make square pegs to fit into round holes because we spoke about that the last time about the anti-Semitism about the rise of Kingdom Now theology and replacement theology uh, if you don't know what these things are then you need to get the, the tape because I, I can't go into them again tonight so why do we need 144,000 evangelists roaming the earth or all over the earth to, to call the Jews and the Gentiles to salvation because we are not here at this point in time we are not here the church has gone and uh, God has to use somebody so he's decided to use 144,000 people either directly Jewish or of Jewish descent to call his people and the rest of the world to repentance whenever we speak to people about the Lord whenever we bring the Lord into the conversation whenever we proclaim the gospel to anybody that will listen to us now they may say oh it's alright for you but uh, you have it I don't need it these are the people don't stop witnessing to them because these are the people I believe who are going to get saved during the tribulation Charles Spurgeon said that during the tribulation it will probably be the greatest revival that's ever happened in the history of mankind 
will be those who will be saved in the tribulation. And what I'm going to set out for you tonight is a situation where those who are saved during the tribulation are not actually part of the church. The church are those who have accepted Christ this side of the rapture or this side of death. Those who go into the tribulation, they cease, they are not the church. And and we'll see that as we look at this this passage in chapter 7. So that was where we left off. That's the sort of pick up point. Chapter 7 at verse 9. So we've looked at the 144,000 and the, the... the way that they have been dealt with or used by the Lord. And if I tell you, you think 144,000 is not a lot of people. And I think I said to you the last time, if you count up the actual full-time missionaries in the world today, those who are actually full-time being there all the time, there's something like 48,000. And here God is going to appoint 144,000 full-time missionaries into a dead and dying world a world that's getting blown to pieces by this stage so anyway that's what's happened when when he's seen that the angels are being held back from bringing judgment upon the earth until these 144,000 are sealed with the mark of God on their forehead and of course we don't really know what that mark is but it's a seal of some description and we'll, we'll, we'll look at that maybe later and in verse 9 it says after this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people and language standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands and they cried out in a loud voice salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honour and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Now then, this company of people, this great multitude causes the angels to worship. But they're not the church. We're there already. So who are these people? And we find in some measure an answer in verse 13. And in my version, which is not particularly a a good translation of the word here, but I'll read from mine first and then we'll look at it. Verse 13, it says, Then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? But if you look at some of the translations, and a truer translation of that word asked is answered. And it says, then one of the elders answered me, these in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? So what was the question? One of the elders answered me, who are these in white robes and where did they come from? And I answered, said John, Sir, you know. In other words, John, the whole context of this is that John was not sure who these people were. He was unsure as to who they were. This elder was pointing up to him. Do you know who these people are? And he said, well, you know. And the reason... Well, that's one of the reasons why I don't believe that this is a church, because John would recognize the church as being the church. But here we've got a situation where he doesn't recognize who they are. So the elder said to him, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits in his throne will spread his tent over them. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And that sounds like the church, doesn't it? But why would God have to lead you to springs of living water when you've already got springs of living water flowing out of you? 
That's what the Bible tells us anyway. And if you look at this situation here, if I can find the right scripture for you here. Revelation 3 and 21. Let's just quickly turn back. Just very quickly to this. It says, To him who overcomes I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Just as I overcame and sat down with the Father on his throne. So that, in reference to the church, to him who overcomes I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. And yet here, in this passage here, it says that they stand before the Lord and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. So the church, the bride of Christ, literally becomes part of the body of Christ. Don't ask me how it works. But we become the body of Christ and we're seated on the throne with Christ. And these people are the people who will serve day and night before the Lord. These are servants of the Lord. They're not the church. In some measure this great multitude may indeed be the great multitude which will return to the earth. Whom you and I will reign over along with Christ because when we go back as the church we'll have to rule and reign over somebody I mean there's going to be somebody to rule and reign over and I believe that this is this is the group that he's talking about here that there will be this the church will be part of Christ we will be part of the body of Christ we will sit with Christ upon his throne as it says in 321 and then these people who are saved through the tribulation will serve him day and night in his temple and we'll look at that a wee bit in more detail just so that we can get it right so the group are not the church this group are standing we are seated with Christ they serve him in Revelation 7.15 they serve him and we are not I know this sounds a bit arrogant and I don't mean it to sound that way, but we, when we become the church and we are completely consummated with Christ in heaven at this point in time, we are not servants of the Lord. We are the bride of Christ. We are co-heirs with Christ. And it's something that we as Christians have to get a grasp on. That we are not, in some measure, subservient. We are co-heirs with Christ. Everything that God has promised in Christ, we are heirs to as well. It will not happen this side of death or this side of the rapture, but it will happen. That is the true consummation of your salvation. If we look at it from the point of view of the, the Jewish marriage that we did right at the very start, we have a situation here where we are already married to Christ. But we have not consummated that marriage yet. The, the bridegroom has gone away to prepare a place for us. And when he has prepared that place for us, he will come back for us and take us to be with him. And we will be with him forever. So we are the bride of Christ. These people are the servants of the Lord. Those who are saved through the tribulation. In fact, if I look at... If you want to have a wee quick look, or, or you don't need to look, but it's Luke 12... In verse 37, uh, if you want to stay with the flow, that's fine. If you don't want to jump around your Bible, I know sometimes it can be a bit, um, a bit off. Luke 12, verse 37. I'm finding myself. It says in verse 37, in this, if you've got the red letter Bible that Willie was talking about this morning, you'll realize these are the words of the Lord. It will be good for those servants whose master finds him watching when he comes, I tell you the truth, he will dress himself to serve. He will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table and will come and wait on them. Now that is what Christ has in store for his church. And these people who are saved during the tribulation, they are servants. They will stand before the Lord for eternity and they will be the servants of the Lord. But we in some measure will be served by the Lord. We are the bride and he is our bridegroom. Now I know that sounds a bit heavy to understand, but that's really what God has in store for us. No eye has seen and no ear has heard nor has the heart of man conceived that which God has prepared for those that love him. 
And that, that's where we're going. So there's different groups in heaven here. We've got the bride of Christ, which is the church, which are us. We've got the servants of the Lord, who are these people who are saved through the tribulation. And we've got another group. And I don't want to get into that tonight, because that comes later in the study. But it's the Old Testament saints. They're not part of the church. And they're not the servants of the Lord. But the Old Testament talks about them as being the wife of Jehovah. And, and that's another title that we need to go into later. But I'm not going to get into that just now because that would take us up another rabbit trail that would be very interesting but not appropriate at this point in time. We'll look at that later. So then we get here to the start of chapter 8. And uh, it says here the start of chapter 8, when he opened the seventh seal, now remember that we've got a scroll here with... with seven seals on it he opened six of them up until the end of chapter seven, 6 and then there was this parenthesis, there was this chapter 7 put in here which divided up the opening of the 6th seal and the opening of the 7th seal so we've heard about the 144,000 we've heard about this great multitude who are going to be saved through the tribulation times and these people, by the way, who are saved through the tribulation times, I tell you, these are the people whom you are speaking to today. Who you share the Lord with and whom they don't understand what you're saying or won't recognize it or just turn away from it. And many would come and say, well, if that's the case, then I'll just wait and take my chance in the tribulation and then I'll give my heart to the Lord. Well, the answer to that, of course, is, if you can't walk with the Lord now, what chance do you have then? You take a big, big risk if you refuse salvation at this point in time. Why put yourself through that when you can get it for free now and be part of the bride of Christ? You don't need to end up being one of these servants who stand before the Lord. Yes, they'll be saved, they'll be in heaven, they'll be on the new earth, etc. But they'll not be, as you are, part of the bride of Christ, part of the body of Christ. So, chapter 8 here, it says, When he opened the seventh seal, this is Christ opening the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I know you're all going to laugh, because I always crack the joke, don't I? Um, this is the proof text to prove that there are no women in heaven. Because there was silence for about half an hour. And uh, that's really difficult for women, I'm sure, right? Anyway, that's the joke past. But you know, when you think about that, it's, it's quite awesome that, that God commanded silence in heaven. The whole heaven was silent. There was nothing. Not a sound. Not a peep. And I saw, in verse 2, the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense together with the prayers of the saints went up before God from the angel's hand. And then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar and hurled it on the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashings of lightning and an earthquake. So quite a dramatic scene here. We'll deal with it. The reason that I believe that God had called for a silence in heaven was because of this one angel who was there to present the prayers of the saints before the Lord Almighty. That was how important the prayers of the saints were. That as we, as the people who had been saved on the earth, the people that the church who was in heaven presented their prayers before the Lord. There was a silence in heaven. And these pray, these prayers that went up before God were something to behold. You can imagine it's the people who were part of the early church and who had been taught out the Old Testament, particularly the Jews, would recognize in this, in some measure, the golden altar in the temple, Solomon's temple, and of course the golden altar in the tabernacle in the wilderness and the desert. So that was a situation there and 
But when I saw the seven angels in verse 2 who stand before God and they were given seven trumpets. If you want to think about being an Old Testament scholar, if you want to think about the churches that John was writing these letters to, the seven churches of the Revelation in chapters 2 and 3. A lot of the people in these churches were Jews and a lot of them were Gentiles. Effectively it was a non-Jewish church because there were no legal observances within the Church of Christ. If you wanted to be a Jew, that was fine. If you wanted to be culturally a Jew, that was fine. And Paul himself observed many of the Jewish uh, laws and and requirements and dietary uh, restrictions, etc. But never once, and he said it on many occasions, I can do these things as long as you don't mix it up with the fact that that's your route to salvation. Salvation comes through the grace of God. Salvation comes by grace through faith and not by works. So although Paul acted as a Jew culturally, he was quite bold in his setting out the parameters that, yes, be a cultural Jew, but don't ever think that being a cultural Jew will get you salvation because it won't. There is only one way, nothing but the blood. So when these churches saw this written down, and we're talking about Old Testament typology here, when these when these churches saw this written down with the seven angels with the seven trumpets, there would be something that would jump into their mind immediately. And it would be the book of Joshua when Jericho was captured. Now I'm going to put forward a few things here tonight that may indeed uh, create a bit of uh, thought. I hope it drives you back to your Bible. The seals in some measure were a sign of man's rebellion. The trumpets that we're now about to enter are a sign of God's intervention, God's judgment. Each trumpet that comes will bring a judgment from God, a direct judgment from God. These people would immediately think of Joshua. Now, whether I'll go over it, whether you know it or you don't know it, the word Joshua or Yehoshua means in the Greek Jesus, and in the Hebrew it translates to God is my salvation, or in short, salvation. So when you look in the Old Testament and you see the book of Joshua, it's the book of Jesus. And in some measure, the book of Joshua becomes a picture book for the book of Revelation. And I want to sort of demonstrate that to you just now. Because we've always said that the New Testament is hidden in the Old and the Old Testament is revealed in the New. So we've got Joshua, Jesus and salvation all being the same thing depending on which language you translate it into. Now in the book of Joshua we find that Joshua was leading the people on judgment of those who were in the promised land. Did you accept that? Now, something that always bothered me early on in my Christian life was that many people talked about when the, when the Israelites crossed the river Jordan, it was like the church passing into heaven. And I thought, well, how can you fight as many battles in heaven? I mean... The Israelites, while they wandered in the desert for almost 40 years, never fought one battle. And yet when they crossed the Jordan, they never stopped fighting. So it's, it's, it's not right to say that when they crossed the Jordan, that was them crossing from, from uh, this earth into heaven. That, that, that's a wrong analogy. What's happening here is, it's a picture of Christ coming with his saints to recapture the earth to bring judgment upon the earth that's why there are so many battles to fight so when Joshua was leading the people in the judgment of those in the promised land we could look at it from the point of view that Jesus coming back with us to bring judgment upon this earth to reclaim that which God had promised because God made a promise in Genesis 15 to Abraham Right at the end of chapter 15, when he had made that covenant with them, we spoke about the five covenants, the last study we were in, 
but the covenant where where the two parties if you wanted to make a really solemn covenant you took a number of animals and you literally split them down the middle and opened them up and the two parties would walk through it and make a covenant with each other and it was an unbreakable covenant but then we found that, that God put Abraham into a deep sleep and when the animals were cut God passed through the animals as, as a flame of fire and literally took it as a burnt offering and when Abraham awoke God made him the promise that I will give you this land that these nations have and it shall be yours and for your people forever now in Genesis 15 it talks about 10 nations that were in the promised land at the time and you can look this up for yourself 10 nations and what do we see in Daniel chapter 7 the 10 horns that were part of the old or the remnants of the old Roman Empire the fourth beast um, and we'll maybe have a wee quick look at that because I can see some blank expressions coming over their faces here at the moment so Genesis 15 talks about 10 nations but then we have a situation arises where when Joshua actually enters the land there are only 7 nations to conquer and it's Deuteronomy 7 and verse 1 that will get you the seven nations when God speaks to, to the Israelites about crossing the Jordan and getting into the land to inherit it but remember that in Daniel chapter 7 there talks about the, the ten horns but there's a little horn that grows up between them in other words the Antichrist and three of the nations in this end times who were part of the ten will be destroyed so 10 minus 3 makes 7 so even in the book of Revelation there will be the 7 nations that come out of the old Roman Empire and uh, will come from 10 down to 7 and we'll have this Antichrist who rises up the little horn destroys 3 of them now in Joshua chapter 5 and verse 13 we find a situation where Joshua goes out to spy out the land and he finds that there's someone there already spying out the land, the captain of the Lord's host, basically Jesus himself, a, a, a theophany or a Christophany, an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. And Joshua himself bows down before him, and Jesus puts in place the plan for conquering the promised land, for, for the defeat of Jericho. Before the place was defeated, it had to be spied out. So Joshua sent two spies into Jericho. Before the earth would be finally defeated, God sends two witnesses into the streets of Jerusalem. So there's a, there's a tie up there between the book of Joshua and, and, and Revelation. Now the two spies, when they go into Jericho, they are abused mightily and they are threatened with death but what did they come out of Jericho with? a Gentile woman Rahab the prostitute the Gentile bride the one who would become actually part of the line or the lineage of David and part of the lineage of Jesus Christ so this Gentile bride is taken out of Jericho before Jericho is destroyed the same way as this Gentile church is taken out of the earth before the earth will be destroyed by Christ and of course they're taken out before the destruction they're told in, in Joshua to take the ark out and the ark was to lead the, 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 the army now it's quite specific in Jewish terms that the Ark of the Covenant was never to go into battle. And yet, here we have a specific instruction that the Ark had to lead them into battle. And it was the Levites who had to carry it. Now, they were the priests and they were never to go into battle. And yet, here we have a situation where the Ark of the Covenant... Old Testament typology Jesus Christ is the true Ark of the Covenant he leads us into battle in these end times 
And who are the Levites, the priests, the holy nation, the royal priesthood? We are. So we march with Christ our head into a battle situation where he is going to take the earth back for himself and for us. And the whole time that that this plan was being put into place for the destruction of Jericho, they had to take a march around the city once a day with seven priests with the trumpets blown. The presence of the Lord is always indicated by the blowing of the trumpets. And of course in Revelation, the blowing of these trumpets would indicate the presence of the Lord because they would bring a judgment of the Lord upon the earth. One specific instruction was given to the people or to Joshua about the people as they marched around Jericho. Although the trumpets had to be blown and the ark had to be there, the people had to be silent. And there was silence in heaven for half an hour. So there's silences here that tie in with the silences that were there in Jericho. So we get a situation here where they march round once a day for six days and then, oh, the Sabbath breakers on the seventh day, which would have been the Jewish Sabbath, they had to march around seven times. And on the seventh time around, when Joshua gave them the order, they were silent no longer, but they shouted with a great shout. The trumpets were blown and the whole walls fell down. Now, when you read the story in Joshua and the way it's worded, it's not a case that there were breaches made in the wall where men could run through. The literal translation is that the whole thing fell down, just like that. That suddenly it was there and suddenly it was not. And every man entered the city where he stood. So you've got seven priests with seven trumpets marching around seven times and on the seventh day. So there's a lot of sevens in there. And of course, being the, into the numbers that I am, the, your, uh, seven is the, is the number of God's completeness. And there may be a point made here that the reason they went in on the seventh day, the Sabbath day, was because Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. That God was trying to make a point that the day will come when there will be no need for an observance of these things. Because everybody will have entered into the rest of the Lord. That the Lord's rest will be complete. You can have a look at that in Revelation 11, 15 to 18, which we'll get to eventually. Now, just to go back a bit here, to get another wee kind of proof bit that this book of Joshua, this book of Jesus is a picture book of Revelation. When they came across the Jordan River, and they came across miraculously, they were on one side, and then the Jordan River parted for them, and they marched across with the Ark of the Covenant at their front. They came to a place called Gilgal. And before... Joshua would allow the men to go and fight they had to be circumcised all of them now if you were going to put an army out into the field the last thing you would think about doing was circumcising them all at the one time I think it would be rather debilitating for an army but when you look at it from the point of view here that in Revelation chapter 7 there was a seal put on the forehead of the 144,000 and here we have a situation and if you look at Romans 4 and 11 if we can quickly get there if you don't want to look it doesn't matter you can look for it later but Romans 4 and 11 it says here and he received the sign of circumcision, that's Abraham, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So Paul tells us that this circumcision was a seal also. It was a seal of a covenant with God 
The same as there's a seal put on the 144,000, there was a seal put on all the people who would, who would come against the, the, the armies of the world uh, at this point in time. Now, if we read further on, we find a group of people, we find a group of people in the book of Joshua called the Gibeonites. And I don't know whether any of you are familiar with the Gibeonites or not, but the Gibeonites were sneaky. Uh, the Gibeonites were the guys who turned up in front of Joshua. They really believed that God was with Joshua and that there was nothing they could do about it. But they turned up before Joshua and his army and they had old worn out shoes and, and their packs were broken and their water bottles were busted. And they said to him, look, we've, we've come a long way here. Um, in fact, they had just come from around the corner, but we've come a long way here and, and we don't want any trouble. We really believe that God is with you, uh, Joshua, and we just want to make a peace. We just want to make a covenant with you. We want to believe in your God. So Joshua made a covenant with them. But later on, of course, we learn that Joshua found out the truth that they had deceived him. And what did he tell them? That you shall be servants to us. You will be waters, carriers of water and hewers of wood before the Lord all the days of your life. Now I believe that that's an allusion to those who would be saved during the tribulation. That they did not believe through fair means, but they believed through foul means, if you want to call it that. They wouldn't accept Christ as he was when they saw it face to face, but only when the proof was, was brought to them. So they, be, they become... The, the servants they become this great group of people that are, are typified in heaven uh, not the church but the servants of the Lord those who stand before the Lord and serve him day and night in his temple saved but saved in a different sense saved to be servants rather than saved to be the, the glory and the bride of Christ so you can look up those scriptures for yourself there but then we find a situation in Joshua chapter 10 and the analogies just go on and on but I just want, you, I want to sort of turn you back to the book of Joshua because it is a real picture book of what's happening in the book of Revelation here now these same Gideonites Gibeonites in Joshua chapter 10 there's a guy called Adonai Zedek who was one of the kings of the Canaanites and Adonai Zedek translated means the Lord of Righteousness this is a picture of the Antichrist. Now, when he found out that the Gibeonites had made a peace treaty with Joshua, and think about it, he's making a peace treaty with Jesus, Yeshua. When Adonai Zedek found out that they were making a peace treaty with Joshua, he got a bit upset about it. And he went to war against them. And he called up another five kings of the another four kings of the Canaanites, so there was five of them in total, who came to battle against the Gibeonites and to destroy them because they had put their trust in the God of Israel. And they sent for Joshua, come and save us, was the message they sent. Jesus, come and save us. And that again is a again the Gibeonites being those who would be saved through the tribulation that they wouldn't accept the God of the true God of righteousness while he was there but they, they would accept him after they saw the signs and wonders when it was almost too late uh, to get by so they come against the, Gideon, the Gibeonites and then they ask Joshua to come and protect them and Joshua comes and he chases the armies of the five kings of the Canaanites and the Amorites are running away and Joshua said there's no room today to kill all these guys now the thing that happens here is quite remarkable because we find it happening in Revelation as well and you can look for that yourself but when Joshua called upon the name of the Lord there were great hailstones that fell from heaven and it says in the book of Joshua that more of the Amorites etc were killed by the hailstones than were killed by the sword of the Israelites and we find the same thing in Revelation that there will be great hailstones will fall upon the armies of those who would stand against the Lord 
Joshua gets to a stage where even with the hailstones raining down on him and the Israelites killing him with the sword, he stands up and he says, you know, Lord, we're never going to be able to accomplish this in one day. There isn't enough time. And he cries out, sun, stand still in the sky and moon, stand where you are. And we find that we get into this strange and spooky place called the long day of Joshua. Around about 701 BC was the long day of Joshua. And if you look at and you research it and you can find it, while he spoke about the internet this morning, it's there if you want to go and look for it. In every world religion and in every world civilization around 700 BC, they all record a long day. A day or a long night, one of the two, where there was no movement of the sun and there was no movement of the moon. Now don't ask me how that works. Because there's only one of two things can happen. Either the earth physically stopped rotating or it tilted. And it could well be that it did tilt. That the polar axis tilted slightly so that as the sun's apparently coming this way, it tilts away and tilts away. So the sun stays in the same relative position. And that could be the the case for justifying these great hailstones because (laughs) there must have been some tremendous weather uh, systems uh, rotating around at that point in time. Now, I'm not going to get into the speculation of this, but there's been a long day of Joshua and it's been something that's been talked about for a long time. But there is a, a, a... There's something happened that day that the sun stood in the sky and the moon refused to move. That's what Joshua talks about. Now, if you look in the book of Revelation, it tells us that there were signs in the sun and the moon. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon uh, will be turned to blood. Uh, And so we see a parallel between the sun and the moon and the sun and the moon in Revelation. So he says, sun and moon stand still. And the kings, of course... What did they do? The kings of the the, the Canaanites, they ran for their lives if they had them. And where did they hide? In the caves. What does it tell us in Revelation just at the end there? That they ran and they hid in the caves. And what did they say? Oh, that the mountains would fall upon us and preserve us from the judgment of the Lord that comes upon us today. Now, there are loads and loads and loads and loads of analogies in the book of Joshua and the book of Revelation we may look upon more of them as we go through it but right now that's about as far as I want to go with the analogies on that side of it but you can see there that that the book of Joshua literally becomes a picture book for the book of Revelation so have a read through Joshua and think about it again for the point of view an end time situation where the, the promised land is the land is spoken about in the scroll of the Lamb the earth is promised to us it should have been us but we gave it away we, we pawned it for sin and the price that had to be paid on the outside was written in the blood of the Lamb and of course we see there that you know the, 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 the prayers of the saints were such that they were so what would we say intense that as the incense and the prayers were mixed together and of course that's an Old Testament analogy as well that every time the priest went into the tabernacle or to the temple to offer prayers he he burnt incense and it was supposed to carry the prayers into the heavens that God would hear them and answer them it would be a sweet aroma to the Lord and of course this is the prayer being finally answered And we think, well, why does God take as long to answer the prayer? Why are we still here? Well, you look back into the children of Israel as well. They cried out for 490 years before God answered them. To God, it's not a long time. But here we have suddenly the prayers being answered. This angel comes and takes a fire from the altar. The prayers of the saints and cast them down upon the earth in chapter 8 verse 5 there and suddenly there's a great 
earthquake, there's great feelings of thunder and lightning and, and an earthquake. Now, you can speculate as much as you want in this, but the earthquakes that we have nowadays, that we see nowadays, the devastating earthquakes, a really big earthquake will last something, maybe just under a minute. Can you imagine an earthquake that would last for a day? Or an hour? Or even four or five minutes? I believe that that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about some really intense stuff. That God is going to bring a judgment upon this earth. And, and it's something that as we look at the book of Revelation we have to be very well aware of. Because there are people that we know who are going to miss it. They're either going to die in their sin or God's going to come back. Jesus is going to return and uh, the church will be raptured and they'll be left behind. And it's up to us to tell them. And we can only tell them if we have an understanding of what it is we're trying to tell them. And if anything, the book of Revelation gives you that understanding, the immediacy of what's about to happen. That we are in the last days in the end times in fact we're in the minute, the last minutes of the last day of the end times everything has been almost fulfilled nobody would have given you a penny in 1906 to say that Israel would ever be established as a country again and yet on the 14th of May 1948 Israel became a country again the, the clock, the prophecy clock started ticking. It had stopped for nearly 2,000 years as we waited for Israel to come back into the land. Nobody would have given you any kind of odds on it, and yet they're there, and they're still there. All we really wait for now is for the last Gentile, or the last person to be saved as part of the bride of Christ, and then it's all systems go. So the quicker you evangelize them, the quicker we're away, guys. You know, that's <laughs> so, think on that. Look at these scriptures that I've given you tonight. Look at uh, the book of Joshua in a new light. Look at it as the book of Jesus. The book of Yeshua, your book of salvation, whatever you want to call it. And look upon it not as the... As the, the as the people of God crossing into the promised land in the sense of going to heaven but as can then retake the earth as it was promised to us in the first place let's pray Father we just thank you and praise you for this word to us tonight Lord and I just pray that you would open our hearts to receive that which you would give to us tonight Lord if there's been anything in this of me Lord then, then just to raise it Father and let all that is of you that stick Lord just write it in our hearts Lord that we might share it with those around us Lord that those who are unsaved that we know within our family and friends Lord that we might have the boldness to say well let me tell you a story and we can tell the story out of Joshua and compare it with what's happening in Revelation Father so Lord I pray for all who are here tonight Lord that, that you will allow them Lord that you'll inspire them to, to use that which you have given them tonight to bring many souls into the kingdom so, Father, be with us and keep us, bless us as we part from this place, Father, and keep us safe until we come and meet again together, or until you come back, Lord, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.